My guest at this time is Gordon Chang. He's a widely respected expert on China and North Korea. He is also the author of The Coming Collapse of China. Today, however, we want to get his thoughts on China successfully landing a probe on the far side of the moon, which has never been done before, and communicating with it through a satellite it launched a few months ago. What does this success tell us about Chinese capability, and how does this weave into China's grand ambitions? And Gordon, thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much, Craig. Well, first of all, what are the most important takeaways from what appears to be a successful space endeavor here from the Chinese to get to the dark side of the moon? Well, China has identified the moon as a high priority for it, and you know we no longer think of the moon as important. We've been there,、um, but we seem to be ceding it、um, to the Chinese, and this is important. I mean, the Chinese have、um, ambitions to harbor.、Uh, To mine minerals and, and the rest of it, but they're also going to use the moon for military purposes. So,、uh, for us, we've got to start to remember that the moon is very close to us. And while it's interesting and important in some sense to know about the far reaches of our universe and our galaxy, we should really understand we've got immediate concerns very close to home. What does it want to do militarily from the moon? There are a number of things that it can do,、um, but surveillance of satellites is important. We've got satellites in high Earth orbit, 22,000 miles above the surface of our planet, and for the meantime, for the for the time now, they are invulnerable. But they might not be invulnerable if China has grabbed the high ground, and that's a concern that we need to、uh, keep in mind as we think about the Chinese. Remember, the Chinese space program is not civilian; it's all military, dominated by flag officers. So everything that they do has a military implication. We may not know about it, but it's there. We're talking with Gordon Chang, and, and, and Gordon, the United States, of course, shut down our, our shuttle program and basically scrapped future projects to the moon and even Mars that President Bush had. That suggested about a decade ago or more.、Uh, what does that say about our mentality versus theirs right now? Um, I think it says that they are much more focused than we Americans are,、um, and、um, that is something that you know we think about in terms of Chinese innovation. They are very good when they put a lot of money behind state-directed efforts. They may not be so good to innovate、um, at a private sector, which of course is important, but nonetheless, the Chinese can、um, can produce some pretty important innovations when the state、um, is. Fully directed at a goal, and you got to remember: How did we get to the moon? We got to the moon because President Kennedy made it a national priority.、Um, the Chinese are doing the same thing right now. We've forgotten that lesson. President Trump has proposed, and I guess is moving forward towards a new branch of the military known as the Space Force.、Um, how does that compare with the ambition we're seeing from Beijing? Well, I mean, we're only talking about、uh, a reorganization of、uh, the military when we discuss the Space Force. I think it's an important thing to do because、um, space is absolutely critical for success on the battlefield, and we're going to have to be able to dominate space. I'm not so sure that we can do that now. We've lost a lot of focus. There's a lot of、uh, inter-service rivalries. It would be good to be able to give one branch of the military the sole task of making sure that we remain dominant in space. I realize space policy isn't your your focal point here, but uh, uh, are we at the point where we'd be playing serious catch up to the Chinese now, or or is it possible, given the you know the the massive head start that we got a few decades back, that we could catch up and eclipse them fairly quickly? Well, I think that we're in good shape,、um, but we're not in as good a shape as we need to be. We've sort of forgotten the Chinese、um, in the last decade or so. Um, where we didn't see them as a threat,、um, so the United States didn't pour efforts into protecting our space assets, at least to the extent that we should have. So right now, it's going to be a, a little bit element of catch up, but we can certainly do that. And、uh, just to,、uh, to bring people up to speed, if they haven't heard our previous conversations, just how big of a threat should we consider the Chinese? I, I think that the China is the number one threat, the number two threat, the number three threat. Yeah, of course, you have countries like Russia, Iran, North Korea、um, that bedevil us, but those countries really don't wouldn't have the ability to challenge us、um, without having the backing of Beijing. So it's important for us to keep our eye on what is the primary threat to the United States, and we've got to remember that Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, has been dropping hints that China is the world's only sovereign state. So.、Um, 
at a very fundamental level, um, this challenge by Beijing to us and to the international community is existential. So we're going to start seeing some infringement on other borders soon as a result of that mindset, or, or is that too soon to say? Well, clearly, I mean, the Chinese have been lasering our pilots. They blinded temporarily two American pilots uh, in the Horn of Africa in Djibouti. Uh, we learned about that in May when the Pentagon announced it. Um, this is the first time I think that the Chinese have injured American service personnel. And essentially what the Chinese were saying, because they have no territorial claims there, basically the Chinese were saying they could do whatever they want. They could injure Americans. We had no right to operate there. Um, so it's important for us to put that challenge into context. And uh, Gordon, uh, as I mentioned at the top, the, the title of your book from a few years back is The Coming Collapse of China. And as we've discussed, there are some inherent contradictions still, of course, in the system. There are some vulnerabilities. Um, what do you see as the most significant ones, and, and how can we take advantage of them? <coughs> Excuse me. Their most significant vulnerability right now is their economy. A uh, Renmin University professor a couple weeks ago created a sensation when he said China was growing at the most by 1.67 percent and could even be contracting. Um, China's economy has deteriorated quickly. I don't think Chinese leaders have a plan. They don't know how to reverse the downward trend except to have a confidence-boosting trade agreement with the United States. I don't want to see us rescuing China at a particular time when they are um, going after us, and they're going very hard. Um, last month, twice, uh, senior Chinese military officers threatened and urged unprovoked attacks on the U.S. Navy. In one of those, a rear admiral suggested killing 10,000 Americans. Um, you know, we sort of sloughed that off, but we shouldn't um, because deterrence is eroding, and the Chinese are convincing themselves that they can actually kill Americans. And we're not doing anything to say, no, you can't. So um, this is a dangerous dynamic. We've seen an officer corps go off the rails, 1930s in Japan. The Chinese, in many ways, are replicating that very, very dangerous situation. Just to go back to the vulnerable state of the economy for a moment, uh, Gordon, does that mean that as long as we're in this trade standoff, it's far worse for the Chinese than it is for us? Oh, it certainly is, because our economy is growing two, three times faster than theirs in reality. Um, and this is an opportunity for the United States to um, um, defend itself and its economy, uh, protect our intellectual property. And we should not be concerned about what happens to China um, because, you know, it, we've had a succession of American presidents who thought it was in America's interest to support the Communist Party, oftentimes um, at the expense of important segments of the American population. Um, whatever one thinks about President Trump, he no longer believes that, and he's acting to defend um, our economy. Um, we can disagree with the way he's doing that. We can disagree with a lot of other things about the president. But at least we have an important change in mindset, and that's going to be critical because you can't defend yourself unless you really try, and Trump is trying. We've barely scratched the surface here and uh, have had to kind of take the 30,000-foot view on a couple of things, Gordon. But uh, in addition to what you just said, what would be the top bullet points for policies or um, strategy for the Trump administration? I think the most important thing is on the trade deal. What we would do is not give them concessions in exchange for mere promises from Beijing. We've done that too many times in the past, and the Chinese have then dishonored their promises. We should keep the tariffs on. We should actually increase the tariffs until the Chinese do what they have said that they would. So uh, we shouldn't just exchange actions for promises. It should be actions for actions. And we should make sure that they stop stealing our intellectual property and stop engaging in predatory trade practices. Um, and um, this is going to be difficult for us. But nonetheless, we've got to do this if we want to have an economy of the 21st century. A lot of different moving parts. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about it again as the year continues. Gordon, thanks very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Gordon Chang, widely respected expert on China and North Korea and beyond. He's also the author of The Coming Collapse of China. I'm Greg Columbus reporting for Radio America.